The house that you see cat a corner from us, everything in red brick, is still a single family home to this day. One of the most beautiful ones here in the French Quarter. For this story, we're gonna go to the turn of the century, early 1900s. In year 1900, Jacques Saint-Germain from France moved here to uh, New Orleans. In American pronunciation, you would say maybe uh, Jacques Saint-Germain. He lived in this house for the next 19 years. Almost two decades in which the guy did not age a single bit. With pictures that we do have to prove it to this day in our historical uh, archives and old newspapers. And a lot of people still say to this day, okay, chill out, some people have really good genes. They're not gonna age that much in only 19 years. Mm, that's a bit of a push, but okay, I could possibly buy that argument. However, when you'll hear the rest of the story, you will see that it doesn't make any logical sense that this was a human being. I beg to disagree, I think he was a vampire. So, for the 19 years that he lived here, he raised all kinds of other suspicion. The guy could speak 10 languages fluently. He could play every single instrument known to New Orleans, a very musical city with pretty much all the instruments in the world present here. He could talk at length about philosophy, chemistry, alchemy, physics, mathematics, and history, and, and uh, literature, all these subjects as if he had PhDs in all of them. A little too much knowledge for a guy who only looked to be about 35 years old at the most. A lot of people were speculating, could he be a vampire to have this incredible knowledge? Could he be much older than uh, what he looks like? Well, for the 19 years that he uh, lived here, he was also famous, at least locally, for hosting all these big, lavish, but slightly debaucherous parties. Parties where he mainly invited men, but we're talking about all the important men in town. Lawyers, financiers, doctors, but especially cops, chiefs of police, and politicians. For these important men, especially for the cops and the politicians, he would hire a bunch of uh, ladies of the night, sex workers that he would share with these important men for favors later. He knew exactly what he was doing. He had these men in his back pocket. He planned it strategically. Well, these parties went on monthly like this, but it came uh, to a sudden end in year 1919. After one of these big parties, when uh, one uh, fine, or maybe not such a fine night, at about three o'clock at night, one of the neighbors from the house right over there, from the house right over there, one of the neighbors from the house right over there comes to this uh, white balcony here because uh, he said that he heard big noises coming from Jacques' house across the street. He called his wife and they both corroborated that from their white balcony here, they saw a woman half naked, one of, uh, one of the sex workers that Jacques had hired, running back and forth, back and forth on the balcony there, being chased by Jacques. When she was cornered in that corner at the end of the balcony, at the end of the gallery right over there, she had no alternative but to jump. She hit the ground right over there I'm going to point out close to, to the end of the house there. She hit the ground there. Now you see, you all see how tall of a fall that is. These are big floors here in New Orleans. She hits the ground there, contorted arms and legs, bones broken, blood was gushing out of her. She looked in really, really bad shape. They also saw that Jacques got really, really extra excited at the sight of her blood, and he jumped from right over there to chase her. And he somehow miraculously landed like a cat, completely unscathed. He knelt down by her side right over there and started licking her bones and sucking her blood right there on the curb. When the neighbors saw this, they wanted to go tell the cops they didn't have a phone yet, and the only way to do it was to get out of their front door, which used to be right over here at 701. They uh, started running from here towards the police station on Royal Street, which is just uh, four blocks on Royal. Jacques saw them from across the street from right over here. He started chasing them, but they were yelling so loudly that other neighbors came to their front doors and windows. So pretty quickly, he gave up uh, on his chase. He decided, okay, maybe a few too many witnesses against me. He went back inside the house to hide, leaving the poor uh, sex worker lady to continue bleeding right there on the curb. He hid inside his house. He came in through this red door over here, right at the corner.
the cops got here very quickly they got exactly the same testimony from the woman there at the end of the house on the curb that they got from the neighbors right here they took her to the hospital and in the end she actually did survive it took her about three months to recover i mean that's a big fall but she did recuperate she even uh, told the story to a bunch of newspapers here even a national newspaper in this case we're talking about the new york times the article is still there anyway that night the cops got done with uh, helping her at the hospital about an hour later so fast forward it's about four o'clock at night they started knocking on his front door he comes to the door opens it up but now he is all dressed in pajamas acting he's very tired drunk and sleepy he goes oh, gentlemen officers why are you waking me up at this ungodly hour what do you want from me what what oh, i'm still trying to recover from this party and they tell him about the accusations from the lady and from the neighbors when he hears all this he goes, whoa, whoa, guys, 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 listen up. If you want to accuse me of anything, accuse me of having a prostitution ring for the last 20 years. Right here in my house to that, I fully admit I'm proud of it, but don't accuse me of attacking my workers and worst of all, of, of sucking their blood. Oh, vile, disgusting. Yeah, 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 I do remember. Tonight after the, after the party. Oh, I had one of these ladies in my bedroom. <sighs> we had fun. And uh, she wanted breath fresh air. I said, honey, go to the balcony, get your stupid air there. And I'm guessing she was so drunk, she just fell off by herself. I did not push her. I did not chase her. But listen up, gentlemen. Listen up. If you want to accuse anyone, start pointing fingers at yourselves. You, yourselves have been having all kinds of illegal sex right here under my house under my roof for the neck for the last 20 years what do you got to say about that huh what what huh what so now all of a sudden all these cops feeling guilty about it they suddenly had no more accusations oh mr saint germain we believe you we believe you just shut up about those ladies and us having fun with them listen all we want from you tonight is a very simple written statement about tonight's events only we have to have a report we have to have your signature would you kindly follow us to the police station give us this report and he goes oh, are you deaf are you blind and do you not see how drunk i am just have I not told you? Just <clears throat> give me a couple hours to sober up a little bit and I'll come to the station and give you your stupid report. I'll, I'll come, just let me sober up. He said, fine, Mr. Saint Germain, not a problem. Take your time, we'll wait for you there. So they left without him. At the station, they waited for him that entire morning and also afternoon. Finally, by evening, they realized, uh oh, he tricked us. They got back to the house here found the front door closed but unlocked so they easily walked inside Jacques of course was gone but inside the living room and the parlors and the bedrooms and all the places where they used to have fun everything was intact as they had remembered it from all the years of partying there apparently Jacques had left in such a big hurry that he did not take a single object with him they finally stepped inside the kitchen in the back of the house on the first floor which was the only place in the entire house that he had kept hidden from everyone's sight for all those years of partying, he had food catered in from restaurants, from uh, other places. He was careful not to show his kitchen to anyone. Because guess what? When the cops finally stepped inside there, there was nothing in there. Nothing to eat, nothing to drink. No utensils to eat or drink with. Apparently, this guy was simply not eating anything. They finally opened the door to that pantry. Tall, but narrow. Top to bottom, all these bottles of wine. They confiscated them. Well, surprise, surprise, a couple of days later, the analysis turned out that each bottle was actually a cocktail. Half of each bottle was indeed wine, but the other half turned out to be human blood. We speculate nowadays that maybe, just maybe, the wine was there so as the blood would not coagulate as quickly. Apparently, this guy was drinking a whole lot of this mix. And I'm thinking that he must have been in such a big hurry that morning he did not take this little stash with him he forgot about it but he remembered about the larger one in the kitchen i'm thinking that's why 
he was careful not to show his kitchen to anyone because he was using it for his main stash, for his main supply of blood. Well, later uh, that evening, the neighbors from this house over here came to the police station with their own report with enough courage. They said that they had seen Jacques earlier in the morning in the intersection right over here in front of his house. He looked a little frantic. He looked a little uh, frazzled. He was shaking a little bit. It was about five o'clock in the morning. The sun was about to come up. Perhaps that's why he was a little nervous. He had two humongous suitcases behind himself. He started running with them towards the river that way. He made it to the end of uh, the next two blocks in about 20 seconds. He turned the corner to the right towards the harbor, towards the port. It was gone forever. The neighbors also said that from that angle, from that balcony over there, it almost looked like when Jacques was running that way, he was not touching the ground. Now, don't think he was flying all over the skies. Let's be honest, he wasn't. But it, they said that it looked that he was hovering above the ground about five inches. Very, very quickly sliding forward. From all these descriptions, I really don't think that this was a human being. Anyway, this is the story of Jacques Saint-Germain, who lived here from year 1900 until 1919. And most New Orleanians will have you know that they think that they never heard from him again. Well, you might. You just might. Thank you, my friends.